Hi, and welcome to the latest NSPCC Learning Podcast. The episode you're about to listen to was recorded in May 2022 and focuses on a UK-wide study by the University of Bedfordshire's Safer Young Lives Research Centre in partnership with the Association for Young People's Health. The study explored the mental health and emotional wellbeing impacts of experiencing childhood sexual abuse in adolescence. This has resulted in the development of learning resources and a report, which you'll find links to on this podcast's webpage. Chloe Gill, the NSPCC's Senior Research and Evaluation Officer, met with two of the report's authors, Dr Helen Beckett and Dr Deborah Ulnock, Director and Senior Research Fellow, respectively, at the Safer Young Lives Research Centre. In this episode, they discussed the gaps they aimed to fill around the impacts of experiencing sexual abuse during adolescence, the importance of learning from young people themselves, taking a trauma-informed approach so that the work was safe, ethical and supportive for the young people participating, what young people said about how sexual abuse had impacted their mental health, emotional well-being, and how they navigated daily life, the resources that have been developed and the six pillars of an effective adolescence response. Chloe began by asking Helen and Deborah about why they embarked on researching the well-being needs of adolescents who have experienced sexual abuse. To get going then, can you first of all tell me a bit about um, how this work came about in the first place? So the research, the report and the resources, What, what, where did that come from? Well, I'll kick off with that. I suppose the first thing to say is it was in response to a call that NSPCC and ESRC put out um, calling for applications for funding for research about how children and young people could be better supported after their experiences of abuse. And I guess in terms of what the piece of work focused on, um, it focused particularly on young people's experiences of experiencing sexual abuse in adolescence specifically. And that was really, we kind of knew from other work that we've done at the centre. At the centre, we have expertise in research on sexual abuse and also participatory approaches. And we knew from that work that actually there were a number of gaps in our knowledge base around this and that's really what kind of drove us to put the application in in the first place place was that we really wanted to try to start to fill some of these gaps in the research evidence base and we put the application in and with our partner the association of young people's health and who also brought participatory experience um, to the project, but alongside that brought a real depth of expertise around young people's health, which we felt was very complementary for this particular call looking at mental health and wellbeing. So as I say, the focus of the work was informed by gaps in the literature, and I suppose there were three key things really that was informing how we, we approached this work. The first was Debbie and colleagues did a literature review at the start and just reinforced that message that actually There's very little in the existing body of research literature that is specific to adolescence and experiencing sexual abuse in adolescence. What's already there either looks at younger children or just looks at children and young people kind of as one category and doesn't differentiate their experience. But actually, we know really clearly from research that adolescence is really quite a specific and unique life phase. And so we felt it was really important to understand what experiencing abuse in this distinct life phase meant for children and young people, how it impacted them and what they need. And because adolescence is so different to being a younger child or being an adult, we we kind of hypothesised that young people's experiences and needs would probably be different than those of younger children and that actually we needed to be able to understand that to inform a better response that is better fitted for young people who experience sexual abuse in adolescence. And the other kind of, it's not an entire gap in the literature, there are some studies, but certainly there, there's a very clear need in the existing body of knowledge to learn more from children and young people themselves. Very often conversations around mental health and well-being following abuse are kind of dominated by professional narratives. And it's really important to us at the centre and that all of the work we do tries to centre learning from children and young people. And so we really wanted to make sure this study, that was the main focus of it. What can children and young people teach us about their experiences, what their needs are, how they want us to respond? Hence the name of the research, Learning from the Experts. Young people are the experts in their own lives. Debbie, do you want to talk a wee bit then about what that meant for kind of how we did the research? 
Yep. So um, to address those gaps that, that Helen just talked through, um, we focused on adolescents. So in terms of the age range of young people, it was a broad age range of 11 to 18 initially, but we did include a few young people up to the age of 21. Um, sexual abuse, in terms of, of our definitions, was defined as per, at the time, the Working Together 2015, um, which takes a broad um, definition of, of sexual abuse, including online, um, as well as abuse by peers or adults, males and females, etc. So um, those young people who we wanted to engage with with this research um, could have a range of these different experiences. Um, but we also did recognise that young people may experience other forms of abuse and neglect, which will also shape these impacts. Um, so we also, as, as Helen noted, focused on sexual abuse that occurs in adolescence, again, recognising that many young people may have experienced ongoing abuse from younger ages that extend into their adolescence or separate experiences of abuse at younger ages, in addition to um, other abuse that they experience in adolescence. Um, the aim was to prioritise and amplify young people's views and their self-defined impacts and needs related to this. So rather than researchers or practitioners identifying what those impacts are, we really wanted to, to hear from young people about what they, what they said impacted them. And so our work with the young people was really at the heart of this research. Um, integral to all of this, we also built into the project a number of youth advisor posts. We had four youth advisors involved in helping us think about the project design, testing out our tools and methods. They were involved in presentations to our funders um, and at conferences and within our stakeholder consultations. And this really helped keep us grounded in young people's needs and what were the right questions to ask. Um, Helen, you might want to speak about the trauma-informed approach. Yeah, and, and, and I suppose it's helpful to briefly reflect on the context of this, isn't it, to start? Um, you know, and we know from our work, and, and I know you'll see it as well, that very often there can be a real kind of reticence or anxiety around involving young people who've experienced sexual abuse in research and, and quite rightly thinking about kind of the impacts it might have and might it have any negative impacts on them. But actually what we've seen is sometimes that anxiety can override thinking about the positive experience that taking part in research can actually be for young people. And so for us as a centre and in this project, it was absolutely critical that we find ways to engage children and young people, but that we did so in a way that was safe, ethical, meaningful, and that we really paid attention to that. So I know probably most people listening have heard the phrase of being trauma-informed. There's a lot of talk about it over the last number of years, and we tried to be trauma-informed in, in how we actually approach this research as well. We felt it was really important to kind of engage in these difficult conversations about how do you, how do you talk about things that may be upsetting? How do you provide wraparound support? You know, how do you kind of engage with these tensions between the benefits of taking part and the potential negative impacts of taking part. Um, but for us, it felt really important to do that because far too often young people who've experienced sexual abuse are silenced and they're stigmatised. And in fact, we know that's an issue in society around sexual abuse, the silencing and stigmatisation of people and actually finding safe and meaningful ways for young people to express their views, their needs, their wants is really important in countering that stigma and that silencing. And also in letting young people realise their right to have a say about matters that affect them. And in addition to that, we have consistently found over the last years of 15 years of research at the centre that we learn so much from children and young people that we would not have we would not have found out if we only engage professionals in our research. It's been really challenging in a positive way to us to hear from children and young people to actually realise that their priorities are not necessarily what our priorities might be and to hear directly from them. So we kind of drew on approaches that we've developed over the last 15 years, thinking about how do we safely hold young people to take part in the research? And I guess it's, it's important to say you can't ever eliminate risk. Nobody can in any research. And, and it certainly wasn't about eliminating risk, but it was about identifying what potential risks might be and what support structures 
could we put in place to kind of help hold some of that stuff? So we talk about this in the report, kind of we have a section on the trauma informed approach that we, we took, but it included things like kind of doing risk and needs assessments for young people to identify what the risks might be. That wasn't to say they couldn't take part if there were risks, but it was to say, well, what can we put in place to counter some of these risks? And actually, what can we do for this particular young person to mean that their engagement is the best possible experience for them? So, so we looked at that. We worked in partnership with agencies, and that's really important um, so that every young person who took part had a support worker lined up to provide wraparound support. So they, they spoke to them before they took part, they were available while they were taking part, and they proactively followed up. But choice and control was absolutely central to how we do this. We know that an experience of, an abu of abuse is all about the others' wants and needs and the others' control. And we really wanted to make sure that we didn't do anything that would replicate those dynamics and in fact proactively tried to offset those dynamics and give young people as much choice and control as to how they took part in our research and indeed if they took part and if it wasn't the right thing for them you know we didn't push that at all. Right thank you um you really clearly explained uh, the importance of this research and the importance of involving young people in different roles in the research and some really um it'd be interesting to read the report and, and hear those sort of practical tips um and, and hear about how you went about doing the research and now i'll i want to ask you a little bit about the findings and um if you could tell us um what young people told you about um how experiencing sexual abuse in adolescence impacted on them and what they wanted or needed in response to that that that's the big question isn't it we could probably <laughs> speak all day about that um so what what we thought we might do is kind of just share a few overarching themes that struck us and, mm -hmm. i mean this will this will come as no surprise you know an experience of sexual abuse in adolescence affected young people's lives in a myriad of ways their mental health and their emotional well-being and actually as part of the research there were a range of diagnosable mental health conditions identified by young people that had come as a result um, of their experience of sexual abuse but I, I guess and, and in some ways we were I was maybe slightly surprised by this the degree to which actually what they really talked about was the impacts on their more general well-being so yes, there's the point at which it reached a threshold and will be diagnosed and dealt with as mental health difficulty. But actually, most of what young people shared about was just the the day to day impacts on their emotional well being, on navigating life, um, and on their emotions, how they felt, on their behaviours and their interactions with people and their relationships, and how they engaged in school and other settings. So actually, there were lots of things that young people identified of the how an experience of abuse affected the day and daily for them in lots of different what may potentially seem on their own you know maybe insignificant ways but actually when you added them up all together meant that actually there there really was a, a very significant impact on navigating life and on young people's emotional well-being and um, now i think kind of what we discovered and what young people shared is unfortunately a lot of that was missed and I know that one of the particular focuses of this, this call for research bids when it came out was about kind of learning about what, what can we do better earlier on before things reach a diagnosable mental health um, stage. And certainly what young people told us is there were lots of things manifesting in their lives that actually could be picked up and could be seen and could be intervened with at a very early stage. But unfortunately, most of them reported that that didn't happen, that actually there were quite a few missed opportunities to intervene early on. And, and I think one of the kind of messages related to that that came out is very often young, the impact on young people's emotional health and well-being wasn't actually really being picked up until people actually found out about the abuse. So unless the abuse was discovered or the young person disclosed the abuse, even though it may have happened some time before and the young person had been manifesting the impacts in many ways. So, so it's not just about thinking about emotional health and well-being needs once there is a disclosure of abuse, but it is about flipping that and becoming much more proactive about is something going on in this young per person's life? Or are we seeing something changing or something that doesn't quite add up? And kind of starting to engage in the emotional health and well-being impacts in the absence of a disclosure or in the absence of a diagnosis, because that early intervention feels like a really important phase. 
I think one of the other kind of probably really overarching findings that struck us as a team when we went through kind of what young people had shared was young people, yes, of course, they talked about the impact of the abuse itself on their mental health and well-being, but actually much more frequently what they talked about was the impact of other people's reactions to their abuse on their mental health and well-being. And that struck me really significantly as we were going through the data and looking at what they were telling us, because it was, yes, of course, the abuse has had an impact, but actually how my teachers responded, how my family responded, how my friends responded, how going through a criminal justice process impacted me, that massively impacted on my emotional health and well-being. And again, I suppose like the missed opportunity message, there's also a positive side to that because actually we can have more control over how we respond and how we support people to respond to young people after sexual abuse. And so that does feel it slightly in our gift to be able to make changes and minimise the impact that those engagements with other people and reactions of other people have after abuse. So we thought it might be helpful just to kind of, I suppose, give a couple of concrete examples of that and maybe think across a few spheres of young people's lives. Because the other thing that consistently came out and how young people talked about emotional health and well-being impacts, they didn't talk about it as a vague concept somewhere up there. They talked about how it impacted their daily life. They talked about how it manifested in the family, how it manifested in school. So we thought we might just take a, a bit of a reflection on that. So. Debbie, do you want to kick off just a wee bit on kind of what they talked about, how they experienced those impacts in the family environment? Yeah, sure, Helen, thanks. So it's interesting because I think in the wider um, literature on adolescence and development, there's a sense that in, in adolescence, the importance of family decreases while the importance of peers and friends increase. Now, certainly we did see the importance of peers and, and Helen's going to talk about that in a minute. But young people talked um, extensively about their families. And so in that regard, um, family does appear to still remain quite important to young people in terms of their support. We saw some really great examples of positive family support. Young people talked around being reassured by their um, family members that it wasn't their fault and advocating for their needs. Particular sources of distress um, were identified though by young people. These included things like fears and actual experiences of being blamed by their parents or anger, um, and also awareness of and a sense of responsibility for how others might be negatively affected by learning about the abuse. Um, these concerns appear to be exacerbated by that increasing cognitive capacity of their own age, being adolescents, being becoming adults, and developing sexuality of adolescence as well. So really, although, although we found um, some of these negative experiences, there are those opportunities, I think, ways that parents can um, be supported, um, be supported to support um, their children through these kinds of experiences. We know that peers take on increasing significance in adolescence and young people spend more time with their peers and outside of the family environment. And again, it was it was a bit of a mixed message in terms of young people's experiences of their peers and how that impacted upon their emotional um, well-being and their, their mental health. So th again, as Debbie has talked about in the family, there were some lovely examples of young people sharing the really important and significant role that their friends had in helping them navigate life after abuse, you know, both in terms of just being a listening ear, providing support and reassurance. There were also examples of friends actually kind of helping young people access professional support when they kind of, when something was shared, they were like, well, I think we might need a bit of help about that. And they helped them access that. And also just because again, one of the messages I think kind of came across, Debbie, didn't it, was that, you know, you do still need to do life but you do also need to impact or sorry to process the impact of the abuse and so it's this kind of what's this balance that you have in life where actually you do need to kind of engage with and process what's happened to you and that that's really important to young people but they didn't feel they could keep doing that all the time because that would just be far too overwhelming so there was a really clear message as well about the the, the important I don't know if source of distraction is the right word, but you know that friends could give a sense of so-called normality and distraction from having to kind of be thinking about what had happened to you all the time and processing that. 
So there were lovely examples of how friends supported and that really feels like actually an important message for us to take on board in terms of where we can invest a little more and support peers to better support um, their friends when something like this happens to them. Unfortunately, however, there were also quite a few examples of actually the reactions of friends and peers actually compounding the distress that young people were experiencing rather than alleviating it. Um, and these were really quite varied. Some were really unintentional and the young people knew they were unintentional. So it wasn't that their friend was trying to hurt them, but their friend just they just didn't understand what they'd been through and they didn't know what to say or how to act. And, I, you know, and I think that that message came out really clearly that we do need to think about how do we support young people? What support can we put in place for them? So if a friend shares something like this, that, you know, that they know how to deal with it without of course because we don't want them feeling it's their responsibility to fix things it's not but how do they kind of respond to it but there were also you know unfortunately some examples of actually kind of peers and probably the best way to say it is like turning on young people particularly in the examples of peer on peer harm of people taking sides and blaming the young person for what had happened and aligning with the person that the young person said had abused them and kind of undermining their story and all of that type of stuff. So there were really kind of very understandably distressing examples of actually feeling you've been alienated by your peers because of your experience of abuse or you've been blamed that it was somehow your fault, a bit like Debbie talked about um, with parents, that fear as well. And also examples of young people breaking confidence. So they thought they had told a friend in confidence, but the friend then told someone else. And again, back to what we talked about earlier in the podcast, the importance of control for young people following the experience of abuse. That could feel like a real betrayal and a real taking away of any control they had when people shared their confidence. And I guess kind of the other thing finally that came up, which feels really unique to the adolescent's life phase rather than abuse experience at a younger age, is navigating intimate and sexual relationships, romantic relationships. And actually this really was quite clearly identified by young people as a real need that they actually needed support, direction, a space to work out. How do I be a teenager? and do romantic relationships and sexual relationships following an experience of abuse. Um, and so there was a really clear ask from young people that actually when they're being worked with that in adolescence, that is part of what they need is how do I then work out what's a healthy relationship, what's not a healthy relationship, who do I trust, who do I not, what am I comfortable doing? You know, a, a sexual encounter may trigger something for them. So that was kind of, again, I think, you know, if we're thinking about what was particular adolescence, that felt like a really strong theme coming out in the research as well. And I think, Debbie, the other kind of area we thought it might be helpful just to reflect on a bit here was schools, because again, came across as a really strong theme in the research, didn't it? Yeah, it did. And and maybe that's unsurprising in adolescence. Young people spend quite a lot of their time within schools. Um, so we did hear a lot about those experiences. And it was, school was identified as a particularly challenging context for young people to navigate after sexual abuse in adolescence. And we found three key challenges around this. Um, the first was around this idea of managing educational expectations whilst dealing with the impacts of abuse. And young people told us, for example, that in, in schools, they often felt like the priority was on their educational um, attainment and achievement and attendance and those sorts of things at the expense of recognising the, the impacts of the abuse that they were experiencing. That was a real challenge for young people who, who were really trying to balance those two things. And, and oftentimes the impacts, the emotional impacts um, that they were um, experiencing, that they were dealing with, um, did conflict with um, their their ability um, to engage within the educational those educational expectations. Um, secondly, they were really navigating a fear of, but actual reactions from peers. Of course, within the school environment, it's not just teachers and educational staff, but their peers, um, their social networks are widening and becoming increasingly important to them. There were some examples where young people were, um, you know, questioned by 
um, police, by social care, by educational staff, there within the school. And this could really generate a lot of um, fear and anxiety for young people. And then thirdly, um, staff responses to the abuse and associated changes in young pe people's behaviour. That idea that they're just being teenagers, this is just teenage behaviour, um, was something that young people talked about within the school environment quite often. So, you know, there's something there about needing um, to develop and help staff to recognise what sits underneath of those behaviours and those changes that they might see, because staff are really well placed if they're seeing young people quite often within the school environment um, throughout the day. Um, young people identified a number of ways in which schools could help, could better help them to navigate these difficulties, and that's things like timeouts, um, school-based counselling, due regard for privacy, those sorts of things. However, they also recognise that schools couldn't provide the holistic support on their own, and so they, they also emphasise that importance of onward referrals to external services. Lovely, thank you. I mean, your research is clearly, um, there's clearly so much learning from this research. Um, I'm interested in uh, the resources that you're producing as a result of doing this research. And can you describe those to us a little bit and what they what they look like and what the purpose of those different resources are? Yeah, Chloe, I'll kick off with this. Um, we've tried in terms of kind of the outputs of the research to kind of take a bit of a varied approach and hope that different outputs that we've put out will speak to different people and feel accessible to different people. So we had previously released a kind of a key messages um, from the research just based on our emerging findings and highlighting some of the kind of overarching findings from the research. We have written up what we would call the full research report, which is a longer report which goes into detail. And then we're also working on with our Young Researchers Advisory Panel on a, an output for young people and also creating a short output for parents. And then alongside that, actually, the young people who've been involved in the project have been working on kind of a training resource for professionals, which is really exciting. I think it's a wonderful piece of work that they've pulled together. They all sound really great. And I think it's it's really it's really helpful that you've pulled out those different messages um, together for different people who might need to support young people who have experienced sexual abuse in different ways. So just to, to finish up then so my last question is around um sort of from your research findings and from what young people have told you what what are the kind of key recommendations that you would give to anyone who is providing support to young people who have experienced sexual abuse in adolescence i think what we have found in the research what young people have shared is a really clear need for an adolescent specific response now that's not to say it's not situated in a wider framework of how we respond to everybody, but a response that attends to the uniqueness of the adolescent's life phase and what young people are going through at that stage in time. And um, so adolescence is of, often kind of described as a, a stage of, is it storm and, storm and strife, that phrase that we use? And yes, there are lots of kind of changes and difficult things that young people are experiencing during that time. However, during that time, young people also have increasing agency, increasing kind of cognitive ability to understand what's going on. And so a holistic and meaningful response to adolescents experiencing sexual abuse has to attend to those challenges of adolescence, but also the opportunities that adolescence offers and a way to work in a more meaningful partnership way with young people, as Debbie talked about before, working with them and um, not doing to them. Another really important message, and I know we've kind of said this as we've chatted, is about it's so important that we don't just focus on diagnosable mental health, that we actually get better at identifying that actually a young person is struggling here and things are changing. So paying at attention to their well-being, their sense as a person. So it is about looking for those earlier opportunities to kind of notice what's going on and to provide some support um, alongside a young person. And I think, you know, I guess just to reiterate the message we've hopefully shared a bit during this chat is, yes, there were negative messages about missed opportunities and things that could be done better. But actually, we also kind of feel that the research shows lots of opportunities for getting better and actually kind of offers a bit of a blueprint for going forward of, well, if we thought about attending to these things, then we could actually provide a better, more meaningful, better fitting 
response to young people who experience abuse in adolescence. And so kind of in the report, we've identified, I think, what we call six pillars of an effective response to responding to a young person who's experienced sexual abuse. So the first pillar is that uh, that need for professionals and those supporting young people to understand the adolescent life stages, as well as understanding um, the abuse and the experiences and the impact of abuse. And then also understanding vulnerabilities and challenges that young people face during this period. So the flip side of what Debbie's talked about, about recognising kind of the difficulties of adolescence and that vulnerability that can be there at the same time, is also about those opportunities that I mentioned. So about working with adolescents. So of adopting kind of a strengths-based approach that really puts young people at the centre and that actually moves away, I think as a society and as how we respond to adolescents, we, we very much frame their agency as a problem. Oh my goodness, they're off doing this, this, that and the other. And actually that agency is a resource that can really be harnessed to support young people kind of following an experience of abuse. So it is about moving from that kind of very deficit based approach to understanding adolescence full stop. And then a third pillar um, is this notion of a rights based framework. We talked a lot through this podcast about that, that notion of choice, control, um, and that's really important um, to prioritise those things where at all possible. Um, for young people to challenge disempowerment and promote self-efficacy amongst young people. We found a real need, I think, for young people to, to be given more information about their rights to safety, the rights to access to support and how they do that, including mental health and emotional well-being interventions. And, and I guess the fourth and, and you know, we have these six things, but they're obviously all very interconnected. The fourth one is about the importance of relationship and recognising the importance of relationship during adolescence and attending to that when we're looking to support young people. And um, we know that relationships are important full stop in adolescence and young people spoke about them as so critical to their experience of mental health and well-being following um, abuse. And so to try to actually just work with a young person about their experience of abuse without thinking about these are all of the relationships and experiences in other spheres of my life that I'm concurrently trying to navigate actually is just not going to cut it because we have to think about the reality of their lives and all of the relationships and things that are going on so the importance of helping young people think about how they can navigate and supporting them to navigate this complex web of relationships that they seem to have to navigate and Debbie, I suppose that leads on kind of the yeah. theme of being holistic to the next one, doesn't it? Quite, quite nicely leads on to the next one, which is this holistic focus on emotional well-being. And there seems to be a real need to, to really look at emotional well-being beyond and before diagnosable mental health issues arise. So young people talked about the fact that they they recognised in themselves these emotional well-being needs before um, they disclosed abuse or before abuse had been discovered, um, but that these tended to be missed. So, so again, you know, really focusing on early um, signs, early indicators of, of some emotional um, well-being needs would be really, I think, really important in this kind of a framework. And, and recognising the need for support from multiple sources, because those emotional well-being needs are quite varied and wide and and different and so recognizing that multiple um, professionals sources of support expertise um, would be helpful and informal support as well um, can come in and and help to address and meet some of those needs and if it was last but certainly not least is that the response needs to be centered around the young person you know we've talked before about the importance of working with not for of identifying with them how they understand their circumstances what they see their needs as, what they see helpful support as being, rather than us as professionals assessing what we think they need or what we think they'd like and we'd be helpful for them. And, and I guess kind of as researchers, we, we really hope that the report and the centrality of young people's quotes and young people's voices throughout the report starts to offer some insights into that, to how young people view and understand what has happened to them, view and understand their needs and how they would like those to be addressed by other people. So it's really important that that's 
that's the road we keep going, which isn't what do we as professionals think needs done about this, but what does the young person sitting in front of me or who's in my life or who's in my school, for example, what do they need from their perspective, what's going on and how can I meet their need? It's really important at the start of any engagement with young people, you know, and we know this about sexual abuse generally and also about kind of mental health and well-being, that you co-create a language, you co-create a framework that works for them and that we don't just engage with them within our predetermined terminology and categories, but actually that really the, the language we use, the ways in which we engage is really driven by what the young person sees the language they're comfortable with, the ways in which they want to explore what has happened to them. And so I think it's really important we find another language, another framework for talking about emotional health and mental well-being after abuse. Thank you. That's been so helpful. And, you know, NSPCC and ESRC are really pleased that we funded this research and there's some really clear messages coming out there for people to hear that will ultimately help um, help us improve how we respond um, to young people's and wants and needs after abuse. So um, thanks again. Thanks for listening to this NSPCC Learning Podcast. At the time of recording, this episode's content was up to date, but the world of safeguarding and child protection is ever changing. So if you're looking for the most current safeguarding and child protection training, information or resources, please visit our website for professionals at nspcc.org.uk forward slash learning.